In the dark alleys of the criminal world, desperate wrongdoers are ready to go to the most unthinkable lengths to mitigate their punishment, or, with a lucky turn of events, escape the punishing hand of justice altogether. However, sometimes their methods are so frightening and repulsive that they make even the seasoned inhabitants of the criminal underworld shudder. Today's story will tell us about how the Guardians of Order hunted for a true virtuoso of impersonation and improvisation whose deeds shook all of Italy. Veronica Panarello, a young woman whose life was full of trials, grew up in sunny Italy. A fateful meeting took place when she was barely 16. In one of the bars, she met a charming guy named Davide Stivel. Despite the four-year age difference, a spark immediately ignited between them. Veronica, enchanted by her new acquaintance, opened her heart to him that very evening. The young age of the schoolgirl did not become an obstacle to their relationship. Just three months after their passionate meetings, Veronica was already dreaming of starting a family with her beloved. She was firmly convinced that she wanted to have a child with him. David, succumbing to the pressure of his young girlfriend, agreed to this responsible step. Soon the lovers began to live together and Veronica was delighted to discover that she was carrying their firstborn under her heart. In 2006, a long-awaited son was born, whom they named Loris. At that time, Veronica had just turned 18, and Davide was 21 years old. The family life of the young couple was not easy. Veronica's parents did not approve of their daughter's early marriage and her decision to have a child while still being a girl herself. Constant conflicts with relatives prompted Veronica to leave her parental home with relief. The birth of little Loris out of wedlock only added fuel to the fire and became an additional reason for reproaches from the older generation. However, contrary to their gloomy predictions, Veronica managed to build a semblance of a family hearth. Despite her young age and all the difficulties, the life of the young parents flowed in its own way. Alas, a treacherous fate was already preparing a fatal turn for them. But while the storm had not yet struck, Veronica made every effort to provide her firstborn with a decent life. Over time, the lovers officially registered their marriage, and some time later their family was again replenished. A second son was born, named Diego. The financial situation of the Stivel couple left much to be desired. Veronica was actually still dependent on her parents, Although David worked, his modest earnings were barely enough to feed his wife and two children. Fortunately, relatives from both sides did not leave the young family without support and helped them with money. Veronica herself did not even think about finding a job. She devoted all her time and energy to caring for the children and household chores. Davide could not stop admiring his industrious, neat and loving wife, who was the most caring mother to their sons. But behind the outward well-being of the young family lurked the ominous shadow of an impending tragedy. No one could even imagine what terrible events would soon shake the quiet Italian town and forever change the fate of Veronica, Davide, and their children. This grim story will once again prove that sometimes terrible secrets can be hidden behind a mask of decency and a mother's love can turn into a blood-curdling nightmare. As Veronica's sons grew up, their relationship with their mother seemed warm and cordial to those around them. The young woman devoted all her free time to her children, but sometimes their communication resembled a friendship between peers rather than the usual bond between mother and child. The reason probably lay in the excessively young age at which Veronica had to experience the joys and burdens of motherhood. Many noticed that even after becoming a mother of two sons, Veronica still had not gotten rid of the rebellious moods inherent in teenagers. It was on this basis that she increasingly had fierce conflicts with her parents. The older generation feared that their daughter would not be able to become a full-fledged mother if she perceived her responsibilities as some kind of game. However, any attempts to reason with the young woman invariably ended in violent tantrums on her part. The Stivel family settled in a small rural settlement of Santa Croce on sunny Sicily, located in southern Italy. In this cozy town, whose population barely reached 10,000 people, everyone knew each other by sight. Despite the charm of provincial life, such early motherhood, as in Veronica's case, was a rarity here and caused surprise among the local residents. No one could have imagined that this reckless youthful impulse, which led to the birth of little Loris, 
would eventually turn into a brutal tragedy that we are about to tell. The fateful day of November 29, 2014 began for Veronica Panarello as usual. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, she hastily entered the doors of the police station to report the disappearance of her eight-year-old son, Loris. The agitated young mother told the Guardians of Order that in the early morning, as always, she had taken the boy to school. According to her, she personally drove her son right up to the doors of the educational institution and saw him join the other children and disappear inside the building. After that, Veronica took the younger child to kindergarten and went about her business. Loris was supposed to stay in classes until half past one in the afternoon. When the worried mother appeared at the school again to pick up her son, he was nowhere to be seen. Veronica searched the entire neighborhood, but was unable to find a trace of her firstborn. Without wasting a minute, she decided to turn to the police for help and write a statement about the missing child. The law enforcement officers immediately contacted the school administration, but neither the teachers nor other employees of the educational institution had seen Loris on that fateful day. The boy's classmates also unanimously claimed that they had not met him either near the school or in the classroom. Most decided that young Stivel was simply skipping classes. Someone even suggested that the child could have been kidnapped on the way to school. However, no one believed that Loris, who was smart beyond his years, could voluntarily get into a car with a stranger. And then the main question arose, how could the boy disappear without a trace on the way to school if his mother personally brought him to the doors of the educational institution and saw him go inside. It was up to the investigators to find the answer to this puzzle, because the life of young Loris was at stake. Meanwhile, the most terrible assumptions were swarming in Veronica's head. Could something bad have happened to her son? Or perhaps there was someone's malicious intent behind his disappearance? The young woman was worried sick, mentally praying that her boy would be alive and unharmed. She did not yet know that in just a few hours, a horrifying discovery would forever turn her life upside down and mark the beginning of one of the most mysterious and shocking investigations in the history of Italian criminology. While these tragic events were unfolding, Veronica's husband, 29-year-old David, was in Rome on business. Being a driver, he was just making another trip away from home where his 25-year-old wife was face to face with the disappearance of their son. The guardians of order, without wasting time, contacted the father of the missing boy. David was extremely surprised by the call from the police because, as it turned out, Veronica did not even consider it necessary to inform him about what had happened. Shocked by the news, the man immediately dialed his wife's number. In a trembling voice, Veronica confirmed that Loris was missing and she could not find him. Without a second thought, David dropped everything and took the first flight from Rome to be with his wife as soon as possible in this difficult moment. But as soon as he landed in his hometown, a terrible post on social media caught his eye. On the phone screen, a photo of Veronica with their son and an announcement that the boy had been found dead appeared. David's heart sank with pain and despair. Just four hours ago, his wife had reported the child missing and now their son was already dead. The body of little Loris was found in a shallow ditch near an old abandoned mill located just a few minutes drive from the Stivel couple's house. The terrible discovery was made completely by chance by an elderly hunter who, as usual, was combing the surrounding forests in search of game. Noticing something suspicious at the bottom of the ditch, the man approached closer and realized with horror that it was not garbage in front of him, but the mutilated body of a child. Without wasting a minute, he contacted the police and reported his gruesome find. The forensic experts who arrived at the scene discovered the tortured body of the boy unnaturally twisted at the bottom of the ditch. The child's clothes were in disarray, his pants were slightly pulled down, and his underwear was completely absent. This fact immediately led the investigators to think that the reason for the violence against the boy could have been a sexual motive. The police suggested that the killer was a dangerous pedophile who not only abused a defenseless child, but also ruthlessly took his life. 
Usually, such perverts do not go that far, limiting themselves to only mocking their victims. But this criminal was an exception to the rule and posed a double threat to society. The news of the brutal murder of a child instantly spread through the quiet town of Santa Croce and plunged the local residents into shock and panic. People were afraid to let their children out into the street, fearing that a pedophile maniac could strike again at any moment. Every family in the town felt defenseless in the face of such a predator. The tragedy of little Loris instantly became the main news in the Italian media. The country's central TV channels incessantly reported what had happened, and the shocking details of the brutal murder stirred the minds of the public. People demanded that the police catch the pervert as soon as possible so that he could face the punishment he deserved. The investigators working on this high-profile case tirelessly searched for the monster who had taken the life of an innocent child. In order to somehow reassure the agitated residents of Santa Croce, the police hastened to assure that they would make every effort to apprehend the killer. However, from the very beginning, there were some oddities in this crime that did not fit into the typical scheme of the actions of maniacs and rapists. The most frightening thing was that the killer had removed the victim's underwear, but then put the pants back on. Such perverts sometimes take the belongings of their victims as trophies, but they almost never bother to put them back on. Moreover, there had previously been no recorded cases of sexual violence against children in this quiet area. All these facts made the investigators doubt that they were dealing with an ordinary pedophile. The police's attention was drawn to the family of the deceased boy. Veronica and David were considered decent and loving spouses who adored their children. Despite the fact that their firstborn was born when Veronica had just turned 18, now she was already an adult and responsible mother. The police decided to take a closer look at the parents of the murdered child because sometimes the closest people can shed light on the circumstances of the tragedy. Talking to the Stivel couple, the investigators found out that due to the specifics of his work, David spent very little time with his family. Being a long-distance truck driver, he was away from home for 20, 25 days a month. In fact, all the worries about the children and the household fell on Veronica's shoulders. The young woman, left alone with everyday problems, often complained to her loved ones about the difficulties that had befallen her. Thus, against the background of forced loneliness and the absence of her husband, rumors spread around Santa Croce that Veronica had a lover. However, when checking this information, the investigators were unable to find any evidence of infidelity. When they came to the Stivel couple's house, the police found Veronica in a terrible state. According to David, the tragic death of their son had completely broken his wife. The young woman constantly cried, refused to eat and communicate with others. As a result of severe stress and exhaustion, Veronica was admitted to the hospital, where doctors had to put her on a drip with a nutrient solution to save her from complete extinction. Even the police officers who had seen a lot were shocked by the state of the grief-stricken mother. Veronica's face was haggard, deep shadows lay under her eyes, and her skin had acquired an unhealthy, earthy hue. It seemed that along with her son, she had buried a part of herself. During this difficult period, the couple decided to send the younger child to the grandparents because Veronica could not fully take care of his needs. David, who supported his wife with all his heart, was forced to quit his job in order to be constantly by her side. The investigators saw how hard the loss of a child had hit the Stivel family, but despite their suffering, the police were obliged to continue the investigation. Therefore, it was decided to take the grief-stricken parents to the place where their son's body was found. Perhaps this trip would help shed light on the circumstances of the brutal crime and bring the investigation closer to unraveling the identity of the killer. The Guardians of Order, striving to extract as much useful information as possible, decided to videotape the trip of the Stivel couple. They hoped that visiting the scene of the tragedy would help shed light on the circumstances of the boy's death. However, the footage that captured Veronica shocked the police. Instead of a grief-stricken mother, there was only a pale shadow on the screen, barely resembling a living person.
It seemed that along with her son, Veronica had buried a part of herself. The list of suspects also included the elderly hunter, who accidentally discovered Loris's body just four hours after the boy was reported missing. Such a timely find raised legitimate questions from the investigators. Of course, it could have been a simple coincidence, but the police were obliged to check all possible leads and make sure that the hunter was not involved in the crime. The Guardians of Order began a large-scale check, trying to find at least some connection between the man and the deceased child. But all their efforts were in vain. The hunter easily passed a polygraph test, and his alibi on the morning of Loris's disappearance was confirmed. Moreover, no fingerprints or DNA traces of the elderly man were found on the boy's body. However, the tragedy stirred up the quiet town, and the local residents, gripped by suspicion, began to accuse Veronica of an intimate relationship, not only with the hunter's grandson, but also with the man himself. In the end, after a thorough check, the detectives removed all charges from the elderly man, making sure that he only happened to be in the right place at the right time, and indeed accidentally stumbled upon the body of the unfortunate boy. The investigation was at a dead end. All assumptions and leads yielded no results, and there was still no evidence pointing to the identity of the perpetrator. In the hope of making a breakthrough in the investigation, Carabinieri, an elite unit of the Italian police, were summoned from Rome to Santa Croce. Having studied the case materials, the newly arrived investigators drew attention to Veronica's difficult relationship with her relatives and considered that the mother could be involved in the disappearance of her own son. Loris's grandmother and grandfather told the Carabinieri about a strange conversation with their grandson that took place shortly before his death. The boy told them that his mother had bought plastic ties for a school experiment. This happened literally the day before Loris went missing. The police were on alert. Ties are a rather dangerous item, the use of which is strictly prohibited in educational institutions. The detectives hastened to contact the teachers of the deceased boy and found out that no experiments requiring the use of cable ties were planned at the school. Initially, the investigators assumed that Loris had simply made up this story. But after receiving the report from the forensic experts, they looked at the situation from a different angle. According to the experts' conclusion, the child's death occurred approximately between 9 and 10 a.m. on the day of his disappearance. The cause of the boy's death was strangulation by a thin, foreign object tightly pulled around his neck. Comparing these data, the police came to the conclusion that the murder weapon could well have been the ill-fated cable ties. The investigators had a new version. Probably, Loris really, for some reason, asked his mother to buy him ties and even came up with a story about their necessity for school classes. In that case, the boy should have been carrying them in his backpack on that fateful morning. But how could the killer have known about this? It is unlikely that the criminal accidentally attacked the child and then began to rummage through his backpack in search of a murder weapon. The Carabinieri were sure the key to the solution lies in the missing backpack of Loris. By finding it, the police would be able to track down the killer. All garbage landfills where waste from Santa Croce was transported were blocked. Several days were spent on a thorough examination of the landfills, but to no avail. The boy's school backpack seemed to have vanished into thin air. Meanwhile, forensic experts continued to examine the body of the deceased child. In addition to signs of strangulation, they discovered another strange detail. Despite the absence of underwear and lowered pants, no signs of sexual violence or DNA traces of the alleged pervert were found on Loris's body. This information made the police doubt their initial version. The investigators were still looking for the boy's killer, but they already understood that they were not dealing with a typical maniac or child molester at all. The sexual motive for the crime no longer seemed obvious. To advance the investigation, the investigators needed to compile a psychological portrait of the killer. But at this stage, there was a catastrophic lack of information. There was nowhere for evidence to come from because the real criminal had left no traces behind. The meager facts at the disposal of the Carabinieri simply did not add up to a complete picture. The death of Loris Stivel remained a mystery and the investigators were just beginning to understand how winding and thorny the road to the truth would be. Who is he? 
the ruthless killer of a little boy? Is he lurking among the residents of Santa Croce, or has he already left the town? The answers to these questions could only be provided by the painstaking work of the police, who had to dissect the life of the Stivel family bit by bit. After all, sometimes the solution to a crime lies in the most unexpected details that are invisible to the uninitiated eye. Trying to unravel the mystery of the death of little Loris, the detectives decided to carefully study the route that Veronica Stivel followed on the day of the terrible violence against her son. And although Santa Croce was a small provincial town, the central street along which the mother and child drove in their black sedan was equipped with many video surveillance cameras installed on houses and shops. Collecting and analyzing the footage from these cameras required a lot of time and effort. Law enforcement officers carefully viewed each frame, hoping to notice some third figure that could have been following Veronica and Loris on that fateful morning. Perhaps some suspicious car was following their vehicle, but no matter how hard the investigators tried, they could not find anything unusual on the recordings that could shed light on the circumstances of the crime. However, soon the detective's attention was drawn to some oddities in Veronica's own behavior. First of all, the video failed to find the moment when Loris enters the school building, although the mother continued to insist that she personally accompanied her son almost to the threshold of the educational institution. After viewing dozens of hours of footage, the police were convinced that on that morning, the woman with the children never made it to the school. Only the younger child of Veronica got out of the car near the kindergarten. Continuing to painstakingly study the surveillance camera recordings, the investigators noticed another suspicious detail. In the frames from the intersection that Veronica was supposed to pass on the way to school, it is clearly visible how the woman suddenly turns towards an old church, the very one near which Loris's body was later found. This seemed extremely strange to the police, because for many years Veronica had used a completely different road. What made her change her usual route on the very day her son was found dead? This question haunted the Carabinieri and only intensified their suspicions. At this stage of the investigation, the police decided not to reveal their guesses yet, so as not to scare off Veronica. But in light of the new evidence, they seriously began to consider the young mother as the main suspect. To check the truthfulness of her testimony, experienced investigators suggested that the woman personally drive with them along the same route that she allegedly followed on the day her son died. Thanks to the surveillance camera footage, the police already thoroughly knew Veronica's path on that fateful morning and wanted to see how she would behave. Veronica agreed to this kind of reconstruction of events. But when the car with the suspect and the investigators drove up to the ill-fated intersection where the woman turned towards the church, she suddenly began to claim that she was moving along her usual route. Veronica's lie was so obvious that the police had no doubt about her involvement in the crime. With her deceitful behavior, Loris' mother only aggravated the suspicions and became the main participant in the case of the murder of her own son. The detectives decided to search the Stivel couple's house and bring Veronica to the station for questioning. Realizing that the police considered her a probable killer, the woman flew into a rage. She categorically denied her guilt, claiming that under no circumstances could she harm her child but the investigators were convinced of the opposite. The interrogation lasted several hours, during which Veronica stubbornly repeated her innocence. But under the pressure of irrefutable evidence, the woman still made several important confessions. She reported that that morning she had dropped Loris off about 500 meters from the school because she was in a great hurry. According to the mother, the boy was supposed to get to the place of study on his own, and someone could well attack him on the way. When asked what Veronica was doing near the church next to which her son's body was found, she replied that she was not at all familiar with that area and had never been there. But these words were immediately refuted. The suspect's sister confirmed that as children, she and Veronica often played near that very church and knew every corner of those places perfectly well. And the surveillance camera footage clearly indicated that on the day of Loris's death, his mother was passing by the ill-fated place. Trying to find new leads and confirm their suspicions, 
the detectives had to watch the many hours of video recordings again and again. The father of the deceased boy was also involved in the study of the evidence. At first, David refused to believe in his wife's involvement in the murder of their son. But when he saw with his own eyes on the surveillance camera footage how Veronica, instead of taking Loris to school, brings him back home, the first seeds of doubt settled in the unfortunate father's soul. The recordings clearly show how the mother and her two sons leave the house early in the morning. Then Veronica, together with the younger child, goes to the kindergarten, and Loris disappears. There is not a single frame with the boy on the video anymore. Only a vague silhouette, remotely resembling his figure, flashes near the house shortly before Veronica's return. The next oddity, contrary to her usual practice, Veronica did not park the car near the house, but drove backwards right into the garage. This happened at about nine o'clock in the morning. The investigators had no doubt. It was during this time period that the unfortunate Loris was killed. A terrible guess that made the blood run cold. Could it be that Veronica, his own mother, had coolly dealt with a defenseless child? And then, as if nothing had happened, went about her business. Could there be such a monstrous darkness in the soul of this woman that she was able to raise her hand against her own son? These questions tormented not only the investigators, but also the unfortunate father, who simply could not believe in the guilt of his wife. David feverishly recalled the image of Veronica, a caring mother and loving wife. How is this even possible? What could have pushed her to take this terrible, unnatural step? Or maybe the police are mistaken and his wife became a victim of a monstrous set of circumstances. David's heart told him that Veronica could not have done such a thing. But the mind, looking at the irrefutable evidence of her lies, insisted on the opposite. Meanwhile, the police, as if obsessed, continued to look for new facts and evidence that would help shed light on the circumstances of the mysterious death of Loris. They were convinced that the key to solving the crime lay precisely in Veronica's actions and movements on the morning of that fateful day. The investigators checked and rechecked every detail, every minute, trying to find the slightest discrepancy in the suspect's testimony. The murder of a child by his own mother, such a terrible assumption did not fit in the head, but the facts were inexorable. More and more evidence pointed to Veronica's involvement in the violence against eight-year-old Loris. It only remained to find irrefutable proof of her guilt and find out the true motives for this monstrous crime. After all, until the investigation answers the main question, why? The soul of little Loris will not be able to find peace and his killer will not be able to receive the deserved punishment. On that ill-fated day, Loris never showed up at school. Everything indicated that the boy stayed at home and when Veronica returned and drove into the garage, she was doing something hidden from prying eyes. Her car remained out of sight of the surveillance cameras, and this only increased the investigators' suspicions. It seemed that Veronica was deliberately hiding something, trying to confuse the investigation. When the police shared their conclusions with the main suspect, she continued to stubbornly deny her involvement in the death of her son. According to Veronica, on the morning of that day, she took Loris to school, then delivered the younger child to kindergarten, after which she returned home and engaged in her usual affairs. The mother stood her ground, insisting that the boy could have been kidnapped right near the educational institution, but the police did not believe a single word of hers. The surveillance camera recordings eloquently testify to the opposite. At 9.23 a.m., Veronica left the house again, and just two minutes later, her car was already moving in the direction of the old mill, the same one where the body of the unfortunate Loris was later found. The woman returned home at 9.38, and this time she was definitely alone. Given such a short period of time, the investigators concluded that at the moment when Veronica dumped her son's body into the ditch, the boy was already dead. But the oddities did not end there. Already at 9.41, Veronica, as if nothing had happened, went to the cooking classes that she regularly attended in the morning. The classes started at 10 o'clock, so the woman left in advance so as not to be late and not arouse unnecessary suspicion. In the classroom, 
No one noticed anything unusual in her behavior. Veronica looked and behaved as usual, as if these terrible events had never happened. The GPS data obtained from the suspect's phone and car fully confirmed the route of her movements, reconstructed by the investigators. It would seem that the picture of the crime is clear, and all the evidence points to Veronica's guilt. But alas, the police did not yet have formal evidence sufficient to bring charges. Not a single surveillance camera recording captured the very moment of the mother's violence against her own son. Therefore, the investigators continued to meticulously collect information, and Veronica was temporarily placed under arrest. The case was coming to a denouement, but suddenly, a female police officer who was on duty that day near the school turned to the police. She claimed that she had seen with her own eyes how Veronica had dropped Loris off from the car right in front of the educational institution. This statement was at odds with the main version of the investigation. However, the police were in no hurry to blindly trust the words of their colleague. After all, her testimony directly contradicted the surveillance camera footage. The route that Veronica followed day after day was traced literally by the minute. Most likely, the female police officer simply confused the dates because the suspect brought her son to school every day, and from the outside her actions always looked the same. Meanwhile, Veronica, who was in custody, continued to shout about her innocence at the top of her voice. But the first seeds of doubt had already taken root in people's hearts. Faith in the woman's non-involvement in the crime was especially shaken when the investigators told her husband David about his wife's obvious lie regarding the route she allegedly took Loris to school on the day of his disappearance. This news made the man doubt Veronica's honesty and side with the investigation. Feeling that the suspect might still trust her husband, the police decided to arrange a personal meeting for them in the hope that David would be able to get a confession or at least some new facts from his wife. After all, Veronica was the only person who had a complete picture of the events of that fateful morning, and the investigators were not going to miss this chance. David agreed to talk to his wife face to face without wiretapping. He admitted that the idea was good, but emphasized that his goal was not to achieve his wife's conviction, but only to find out the truth about what happened. On January 6th, 2015, a month after the violence against Loris, a meeting between David and Veronica took place in prison. According to the laws of the country, the man had no right to be there, but for the sake of the opportunity to get closer to unraveling the terrible crime, the police made an exception for him. The first thing Veronica did, without even greeting her husband, was ask if he had a wiretap microphone on him. David assured that he had no recording devices on him and demonstrated the absence of bugs to confirm his words. He did not lie. Microphones were really unnecessary because the whole meeting was still being recorded by a surveillance camera installed in the prison room. During the conversation, Veronica stubbornly stood her ground, repeating the same version of events over and over again. She kept saying that she had taken Loris to school and had no idea what had happened to the boy next. The woman repeated these words like a mantra to everyone. The police, lawyers, her husband, relatives who visited her behind bars. She seemed to have taken on the role of an innocent victim who was unjustly accused of a monstrous crime. Nevertheless, despite all the efforts of the investigators, it was not yet possible to prove Veronica's involvement in the violence against her son. Even the motive for the murder remained a mystery. After all, everyone who knew the suspect unanimously claimed that she was a wonderful mother who sincerely loved her children. Of course, sometimes there were unkind rumors that abound in any city that is even slightly notable. But the police carefully checked every rumor and found no confirmation of them. The official version of the investigation, according to which the mother brutally dealt with her own child, seemed so monstrous and unnatural that even the seasoned guardians of order refused to believe it. But the facts stubbornly added up to a single picture and only the last piece was missing in this mosaic, irrefutable evidence that would finally expose Veronica and force her to confess to what she had done. The investigators continued to methodically collect information, interview witnesses, and analyze surveillance camera recordings. 
They were firmly determined to see the case through to the end and find the killer of little Loris, whoever he turned out to be. After all, while the criminal is at large, no family in Santa Croce can feel safe, and the shadow of the terrible tragedy will long hover over the quiet Italian town, reminding that sometimes evil lurks behind the most respectable mask. Apparently, Veronica's sincere love and care for her children was indeed beyond doubt. Rumors about her unworthy behavior as a mother were not confirmed. The only argument in favor of the version about the woman's involvement in the death of her son remained her extremely depressed emotional state, aggravated by imprisonment. Depression and unstable psyche seemed to the investigators to be the only plausible motive for such a terrible crime. However, the investigation has again reached an impasse. Then the detectives decided on an unexpected move, to allow the grief-stricken mother to say goodbye to her deceased child right at his grave. Accompanied by a whole motorcade of police cars with flashing lights on, Veronica was taken to the cemetery. From the outside, it might seem as if a notorious maniac was being transported through the city under escort. Of course, the officers prudently installed a listening device on the tombstone. They were sure, left alone with the resting place of her son, the grief-stricken mother would not stand it and give herself away, either confess to what she had done or ask the boy for forgiveness for her monstrous act. What was the surprise of the Guardians of Order when Veronica spoke something completely different from what they expected to hear? Crying over the child's grave, the woman begged the heavens for justice. She swore that she would find the real culprit of Loris's death and punish him with her own hands. For the police officers lurking in ambush, these words came as a complete surprise. They could only escort Veronica back to her cell in bewilderment. But on the way to prison, something strange happened. The young mother suddenly declared that she had experienced some kind of insight at the cemetery. Allegedly, fragmentary memories of that fateful day, previously eluding her memory, began to return to her. However, Veronica refused to share them with the police, demanding instead a new meeting with her husband. On November 6, 2015, David again crossed the threshold of the prison cell where his wife was being held. Like all meetings of prisoners, this meeting was thoroughly documented. But this time, the suspect behaved differently. For the first time since the beginning of the investigation, Veronica admitted that she had lied about the events of the day Loris disappeared. Now she claimed that on that ill-fated morning, she had not taken her son to school at all. Falteringly and confusedly, the woman tried to describe a certain unusual state in which she was during those hours. According to her, reality seemed to slip away, plunging consciousness into a thick fog. Only vague, fragmentary images appeared before the mind's eye. Veronica remembered taking the younger child to kindergarten and then returning home, where Loris should have stayed. The older son did not want to go to classes that day, so the mother allowed him to stay. Further, there was a gap in Veronica's memories. She seemed to have dropped out of reality for several hours, and when she came to her senses, Loris was no longer in the house. Deciding that she still took the boy to school, the woman went about her daily business. And only when she appeared at the doors of the educational institution after lunch and did not find her son there, she realized her terrible mistake. Having listened to his wife's faltering story, the investigators were in no hurry to believe the details that had suddenly surfaced in her memory. They say it's just a trick designed to mitigate guilt and get the court's leniency. Like, a repentant mother who became a victim of her own clouding of mind deserves less punishment than a cold-blooded child killer. However, there were those who admitted Veronica's state of mind could indeed have pushed her to take a terrible step. Alas, the suspect's younger child was too small to give the police testimony about whether he had seen his older brother on the day of his disappearance. This fact only added mystery to the case. And although the investigators were still convinced of the mother's involvement in her son's death, they decided to play along with her. Veronica was offered to return to the empty house, allegedly in order to awaken new memories in her subconscious. The police led the woman through the rooms that had kept an ominous silence since that very day. But as soon as she crossed the threshold of the nursery where little Loris always frolicked, 
the suspect put on a whole performance. In a lifeless, emotionless voice, she began to speak on behalf of her deceased son, reproducing an imaginary dialogue with him. At that moment, the investigators finally became convinced. Before them was an unscrupulous liar and manipulator, skillfully playing on pity in order to lead the servants of the law along a false trail. But how, being of sound mind, did Veronica manage to deceive everyone around her for so long and virtuously? During the investigation, she communicated with dozens of specialists, psychologists, criminologists, experts, and not one of them doubted her sincerity. The suspect's defender insisted, she really suffers from some kind of mental ailments that deprive the woman of the ability to adequately perceive reality. As a result, Veronica presented to the police and the public yet another version of what happened. And although the guardians of order treated her stories with healthy skepticism, this story found many supporters. According to the mother, having returned from the kindergarten, she began her usual chores, started washing bottles for the baby. That morning, Loris flatly refused to go to school, and the woman did not insist. The child calmly played in his room while Veronica was busy around the house. Nothing boded trouble. But when, after some time, the mother entered the nursery, a terrible picture appeared before her eyes. Loris was lying on the floor without signs of life, and plastic ties were pulled around his neck. Apparently, the boy was playing with a dangerous find and at some point tightened the noose around his own throat. The ties, connected to each other like a chain, mercilessly cut into the tender skin, not allowing a single breath. Caught off guard by the terrible sight, Veronica, according to her, succumbed to panic. With trembling hands, she tried to dial the emergency service number, but her fingers refused to hit the right buttons, either from excitement or from the approaching madness. And when she finally pulled herself together and ran to her son, he was no longer showing signs of life. No matter how hard the mother, maddened with grief, tried, she could not tear the ties with her bare hands. They only dug deeper into Loris's throat, finally depriving him of his last hope of salvation. The terrible truth struck Veronica like a bolt of lightning. She realized that what had happened would certainly be blamed on her. In the eyes of others, the grief-stricken woman would instantly turn into a cold-blooded child killer, and then, gripped by animal horror, in a semi-insane state, Veronica decided on the unthinkable, to get rid of the body of her own child. Later, forensic experts will indeed find characteristic scratches on the neck and face of the deceased. Obviously, trying to tear off the suffocating noose, the boy dug his nails into his own skin, but the plastic bonds cut too deeply into the flesh, not allowing them to be released. The investigators even admitted the possibility that the mother, maddened with fear, could have yanked the ties in desperation, only aggravating the situation and unwittingly accelerating Loris's death from asphyxiation. This heartbreaking story told by Veronica became another twist in the tangled case. In part, it shed light on the mysterious circumstances of the child's death, but at the same time, it raised even more questions. Why didn't the boy call his mother for help when playing with the ties began to pose a real threat to life? What made the woman go for concealing the corpse instead of going to the police? And most importantly, could this monstrous tragedy be not an accident but a cold-blooded crime? The investigation had yet to find answers to these questions. In the meantime, the residents of Santa Croce, shocked to the depths of their souls by what had happened, were tormented by painful doubts. They did not want to believe that a mother was capable of taking the life of her own child with such ease. But it was also impossible to write off what happened as a mere accident. There were too many strange, inexplicable details that distinguished this frightening story. And the public waited with bated breath for the finale of the investigation, which would shed light on the mystery of the death of little Loris. Whatever the outcome of the case, the residents of the town were sure of one thing. Their peaceful provincial life would never be the same again. According to Veronica's new version, her son Loris became a victim of a fatal accident. As the mother claimed, on that ill-fated morning, the boy pulled the plastic ties found at home around his own neck. With fear in his eyes, 
The child tried to free himself by pulling on the end of the improvised noose, but instead, the loop only dug deeper into the tender skin, mercilessly cutting off the access of oxygen. Veronica assured that, having discovered her son in such a distressed state, she rushed to help. Realizing that it would not be possible to break the strong ties with bare hands, the woman dashed to the kitchen for scissors. Alas, when she returned to the nursery and cut the plastic noose, Loris was no longer showing signs of life. The boy had lost consciousness and was not breathing. According to the mother, the terrible find plunged her into a state of acute panic. With trembling hands, Veronica tried to dial the emergency service number, but her fingers refused to hit the buttons and the numbers swam before her eyes. The horror of what had happened literally paralyzed the unfortunate woman, and at that fateful moment, it was as if a switch clicked in Veronica's head. She suddenly realized with frightening clarity she would certainly be blamed for her son's death, a negligent mother who did not look after her child. In the eyes of others, she would instantly turn from a victim of tragic circumstances into a cold-blooded child killer. Gripped by animal fear, being in a completely insane state, Veronica decided on the unthinkable, to get rid of the body of her own child. Later, the results of the forensic medical examination indirectly confirmed the mother's words. Characteristic scratches were indeed found on the face and neck of the deceased Loris. Apparently traces of the boy's desperate attempts to tear off the suffocating ties. Alas, the plastic noose cut too deeply into the skin, not allowing it to be released. The investigators even admitted the possibility that the mother, maddened with fear, could have yanked the ties in a panic herself, only aggravating the situation and unwittingly accelerating her son's death from asphyxia. To shed light on the blank spots in the suspect's testimony, the police decided to deliver her together with her husband David again to the place where Loris's body was found. Here, the grief-stricken mother finally admitted she really threw the lifeless child into the ditch with her own hands. But at the same time, Veronica stubbornly denied her involvement in the boy's death. The woman answered all the investigators' questions in a confused and reluctant manner. She was unable to clearly explain why Loris's underwear was missing from the corpse. This detail did not fit into the version of the accident voiced by her in any way. The very fact of what happened also raised considerable doubts. For what reason would an eight-year-old child, even out of pure curiosity, tighten a deadly noose around his own neck? Why didn't Loris call his mother when the situation began to get out of control? Veronica had no answers to these questions. Later, the suspect seemed to remember another important detail. According to her, Loris's corpse was badly damaged when it fell into the ditch. Allegedly, the ravine turned out to be too deep, which is why the boy's body, rolling head over heels down the slope, was covered with numerous abrasions and took on an unnaturally twisted pose. But even these explanations did not convince the investigation of Veronica's innocence. At the trial, the prosecution tried to refute her confessions, referring to the woman's uncharacteristic behavior, which most alarmed the guardians of order. First of all, the prosecution pointed to a strange maneuver that Veronica made for some reason on that ill-fated morning. Having parked the car in the garage, the woman turned the car in such a way that it would be convenient to inconspicuously load a large bundle into it. For example, a body wrapped in cloth and this was done at a time when the mother could not yet know about Loris's death, who, according to her own admission, allegedly died later. In the prosecutor's opinion, such actions clearly indicated the premeditated nature of the murder. However, Veronica's lawyers continued to insist on the innocence of their client. They claimed that the mother did not kill the child. The boy became a victim of a tragic accident, independently taking his own life through negligence. Gripped by shock and horror, realizing the full gravity of what happened, Veronica simply got confused and did stupid things. The fear of the inevitable accusation of her son's death pushed her to a desperate step, concealing the body. But this does not at all mean that the unfortunate woman deliberately harmed Loris. There remained, however, one key question that the defense could not give a convincing answer to. If the boy's death was really accidental, 
Why did Veronica need to take off his underwear and then put his pants back on? The defendant herself got off with vague excuses on this score, referring to memory lapses. But the prosecution had its own very plausible explanation. The prosecutor insisted, having removed the underpants from her murdered son, Veronica deliberately tried to stage an attack by a sexual maniac. The calculation was cynical but correct. The police would certainly follow a false trail, focusing on the search for a rapist pedophile. And at first, this trick worked. The investigators really began by working out the version of the involvement of a sexual sadist operating in the vicinity in the crime. And only later, having sorted out the details, the Guardians of Order realized, before them, was nothing more than a competent staging. At one of the court hearings on the case of the murder of Laura Stivel, sensational information was heard that shocked the audience. Desperate to prove her innocence, Veronica suddenly gave a new, completely unexpected version of what happened. According to the defendant, the boy's death was caused by his own grandfather on the paternal side, Andrea Stivel. As Veronica told the court, she was connected with her husband's father by far from family ties. Allegedly, for a long time, the father-in-law had a secret, intimate relationship with his daughter-in-law. And it so happened that it was on the day of the murder that little Loris caught the lovers during another date. The boy began to threaten that he would immediately tell his father about everything. And then Andrea, gripped by anger and fear of exposure, attacked his grandson and strangled him. Despite the absurdity of such a statement, the investigators were obliged to check Veronica's words. Once again, they began to scrupulously study the recordings from the surveillance cameras. And they came to the conclusion that on the morning of the day of the murder, not a single outsider man entered the house of the Stivel couple. However, the police were much more interested in another fact. Watching the video in which Veronica leaves the house around 9.30 in the morning, the Guardians of Order drew attention to a suspicious detail. In the back seat of the woman's car, the silhouette of a certain passenger seemed to be visible. To check this lead, law enforcement officers involved experts specializing in the analysis of video materials. Alas, the professionals did not confirm the investigator's guess. In their opinion, the strange shadow on the seat was just an optical illusion the result of the play of light and glare on the windows of the car. Andrea Stivel himself, who was informed of his daughter-in-law's testimony, sharply refuted her accusations. The man stated that he had never had an affair with his son's wife and was even less involved in the murder of his own grandson. According to the elderly man, Veronica once again tried to defame his name and lead the investigation along a false path, composing a completely fantastic version. Other facts also spoke in favor of Andrea's non-involvement in the crime. At the time of Loris's death, his grandfather had an iron alibi, confirmed by witness testimony. In addition, when checking Veronica's telephone calls and emails and her father-in-law, it was not possible to find a single confirmation of the love affair that the defendant was talking about. In the end, the investigation completely removed suspicion of the murder of his grandson from Andrea Stivel. None of the representatives of the law believed the new, shocking version voiced by Veronica. The trial was coming to an end, but until the last day of the hearings, it was not possible to achieve an unambiguous understanding of what actually happened on that fateful November day in 2014. The prosecution insisted on Veronica's guilt, pointing to numerous inconsistencies in her testimony and behavior uncharacteristic of a grief-stricken mother. The defense stubbornly adhered to the version of Loris's death as a result of an accident. According to the lawyers, it was panic and fear at that moment that pushed Veronica to a stupid and reckless act, concealing the body of her own child. The court and the jury faced an extremely difficult task to determine who Veronica Stivel really was, a cold-blooded child killer who decided on an unthinkable crime, or a victim of a tragic set of circumstances who could not cope with the horror that came over her and made irreparable mistakes. But whatever verdict Themis passed, one thing was clear. The life of little Loris, untimely and cruelly cut short, would never return. 
and the pain and suffering of his loved ones could not be cured by years or even the most severe sentence for the guilty. Veronica Stival's behavior throughout the investigation and trial suggested that the investigation was dealing with a person suffering from serious mental disorders. This was unanimously claimed by both law enforcement officers and experts involved in the case. What is the inadequate reaction of the suspect during one of the interrogations when she suddenly began to sing for no reason? And how many times did the officers observe how her speech from calm and intelligible abruptly changed to incoherent muttering to herself and her gaze froze and became empty, as if glassy. It seemed that Veronica periodically lost touch with reality, immersing herself in some kind of her own parallel world. Often she was caught imitating smoking a cigarette, which in fact was not in her hands, as if the woman had gone so deep into herself that the surrounding reality ceased to exist for her. Veronica's own mother also told the court about her daughter's mental problems. As it turned out, mental disorders had haunted the defendant almost from infancy. As a child, she became a victim of sexual violence by older boys. The trauma experienced at such a tender age could not but affect the girl's further development. Already at the age of 14, Veronica first tried to settle scores with life by swallowing bleach after a quarrel with classmates. And a year later, she made a second suicidal attempt, this time deciding to hang herself in a greenhouse. Later, Veronica even had to undergo a course of treatment in a psychiatric clinic. The investigators were most shocked by the story of how once a girl in hysterics called her mother and begged to take her home, assuring that her brother had raped her. Alas, the accusations of incest never found any confirmation, and no one simply believed the words of the insane patient. But despite all this eloquent evidence of Veronica's mental instability, the official examination came to an unexpected conclusion. According to experts, at the time of the murder of her son, the woman acted surprisingly cold-bloodedly, prudently, and cruelly. She had no serious deviations that would allow her to be recognized as insane and relieve her of responsibility for what she had done. The trial of Veronica Stivel dragged on for a long four years, an unprecedented period for such cases. Numerous postponements of meetings, conflicting testimonies of witnesses, suddenly opening new circumstances requiring additional investigative actions, all this time after time, delayed the moment of justice. But in the end, the jury rendered its verdict. The defendant was found guilty of premeditated murder of her own child and concealing his body in order to avoid responsibility. The judge announced the sentence, 30 years in prison. It would seem that such a severe punishment should, if not soften, then at least reconcile the grief-stricken relatives with the loss. But Veronica did not even think to calm down. Barely realizing that the verdict was not in her favor, the woman jumped up from her seat and began to shout at the unfortunate Andrea Stivel, the grandfather of the deceased Loris, all those absurd and dirty accusations that sounded from her lips during the court hearings. The confused bailiffs, had to forcibly remove the defendant from the courtroom. Straight in handcuffs, Veronica was escorted to a prison cell where she would have to spend the next three decades. To this day, the sword of Damocles of Justice hangs over the head of Veronica Stivel. The truth about what actually happened to eight-year-old Loris will probably remain buried in the dungeons of her consciousness. No one knows if this terrible secret will ever come out. But most of the investigators who have devoted more than one year to the investigation of the tangled case are inclined to the same version. In their opinion, the boy's death was not an accident as the mother tried to present. Most likely, on that ill-fated day, Loris refused to go to school for some reason. Perhaps this had happened before. Because of absenteeism, a quarrel broke out between mother and son, and in a fit of uncontrolled anger, Veronica strangled the child with the ill-fated ties. And then, realizing what she had done and fearing the inevitable punishment, she got rid of the body and began to lie right and left, trying to cover her tracks. However, the discovery of cable ties purchased by a woman on the eve of the tragedy leads to even more ominous reflections. Was the murder of Loris a pre-planned, cold-bloodedly conceived and prepared crime? 
Perhaps the mother had long held a grudge against her unwanted offspring and was only waiting for a suitable moment to implement her monstrous plan? Alas, the true motives and circumstances of this terrible massacre are most likely never to become public knowledge. The life of David Stivel, the father of the deceased boy, seemed to fall apart into small fragments after the verdict was passed on his wife. Overnight, the man lost his beloved son, adored wife, and even his job. Throughout all these years, David never gained firm confidence that it was Veronica who had massacred Loris. The father had never noticed in his wife, who always seemed to him a caring and loving mother, the slightest tendency to violence against children. He simply could not understand what could have pushed her to such a monstrous step. Today, David Stival is trying to live for the sake of his younger son, the only thing he has left from his family. Elderly parents help him in the difficult task of raising the boy. The father draws strength to move on, in the hope that someday, the truth about what happened to his older child will still come out. And then, the executioners of little Loris, whoever they turn out to be, will certainly answer for their atrocity to the fullest extent of the law.